Now we want to leave sample size behind and start thinking about the other topic in the section, which is some broad strokes ideas about confidence intervals. So the first thing we want to remind ourselves is something we learned about in chapter 9.1 and then we saw it again in 9.2, um, which is that your margin of error, which is um, capital E, is half the width of the interval. Now keep in mind what that means, and I've drawn a little picture for you here. So the confidence interval is from one edge to the other, it's the part that's in green, and your error is half of that with your point estimate right in the middle. So if you have a larger error, if these red bars here get larger, they get longer and stretch out, that's going to mean automatically the green section is also going to stretch out. So the larger error means a larger interval, longer interval, wider interval. There we have it. By the same token, having a smaller error, if you imagine those red bars shrinking in, that's going to mean you have a smaller, narrower um, interval, shorter as well. We already have seen that a couple times, but there it is again. So your error and your interval are basically the same thing. The error is just half the interval. That's all. So it's half the width of the confidence interval. Matter of fact, I'm going to line that whole thing. Error is half the width. Super, super, super important. Okay, now we've reminded ourselves of that. Now what about sample size and error in the interval? How does sample size relate to all of that? So what we're going to do is we're going to um, look at confidence intervals and how the confidence interval for the mu changes with these provisions. So notice x bar is the same, s is the same, confidence level is the same. What's changing here is my um, n my sample size. And I want to see what happens to my confidence interval as I do that. Now remember, you can find confidence intervals very quickly and easily with a calculator. Now the confidence interval for a mu, now how would we know that? Well, go back to your appendix and look at the confidence interval formulas. The one that's for mu is the one that's for mean right here. And I tell you right here which one to use. Use the t interval. So let's go to the calculator and go to T interval. Stat, tests, number eight is T interval. Now you have a choice at this point. You have data and stats. We use data on the example we did in section 9.2 because we actually had a column of data. But we don't have that in this problem. All we have are a bunch of statistics given to us in a table. Sometimes they won't even be nice and give it to us in a table. They're going to give it to us in a big paragraph and we're going to have to read and analyze it to find the values we want. That'll be fun. All right, so our x bar is 350, our s is 100, and our n is 50. And then I'm going to leave the confidence level at 0.95 and press Enter. And I get a confidence interval of 321.58 and 378.42. So I type those values in right here. And before I go find the error, I'm actually going to find all the intervals because it's the same process over and over and over again. So I'm going to take a t interval, 350, 100, but instead of 50, I want 150 for the second one. So I'm going to do that and then go down to calculate, enter. And I get 333.87 and 366.13. So I'm going to put that one in right here. And now I've got to do it again, one last time. Stat, test, number eight. And I want to make the n turn into 250. Oops, I went too far. 250. Down to calculate, press enter. And I get 337.54 and 326.4, or 362.46, excuse me. Now, what is the error on all of these? Well, the error is half the width, right? So let me just remind you that. There we have it, half the width. Okay, so what is the width? Well, the width is the distance from the high number to the low number, right? Remember this picture up here. So the high number is up here, the low number is down here, the upper and the lower, if you will. There, I've even labeled them upper bound and lower bound for you to see. So you want to take your upper bound minus your lower bound and then cut it in half. All right, so I'm going to take the upper bound is 378.42. So I'm going to take um, 378.42, I'm going to subtract away 321.58, and I'm going to cut it in half. Or if you like, you can think of it as a half times that value. 
right? So you take the difference and then subtract, you subtract the, excuse me, subtract to find the difference and then take a half of that. Either way you want to write it is fine. So now let me go grab a calculator. And I'm going to do this all at once. That way I don't have to um, reinvent the wheel every time I go do this. So I'm going to take 378.42 minus 321.58. Close my parentheses, divided by 2. Or if you like, you could say 1 half times, actually you don't even need the time symbol, 378.42 minus 321.58. So whichever way you're more comfortable with is fine. So it's 28.42, either way you slice it. And that is our error. Now we just have to do it again and again and again. So I'm going to underline this one because that's the error for this one. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the next one. And for the next one, I'm going to write it differently. I'm going to do the other writing just so you can see both of them when you go to your notes. So this one's 333.87 minus 366.13 and cut it in half. And that's going to be 16.13 if I'm not mistaken. So let me prove it to you. 333.13. Oh, no. Oops. My fault. 366. 0.13 minus 333.87. I'm just having typing problems. And divide it in half. There we go, 16.13. So I was right there. And then again for the next one, but with those new numbers. Oh, that's why I did it wrong on the last one. I accidentally typed them backwards. So you want the higher minus the lower one. Sorry about that. There we go. So take the higher number minus the lower number and cut it in half. I mean, it would have worked if you did it the other way. It just would have come out negative. And technically, error cannot be negative. The error has to be positive. All right. So we found all of our values. Great. And now notice what's happening to our sample size. Or, excuse me. As our sample size increases, notice what's happening to our error over on the right. That's the underlined portion. There, look what's happening. It's getting smaller. As n increases, as our sample size n gets larger and larger, our error gets smaller and smaller, which makes sense, right? Because we're learning more and more about our sample and our population. As we learn more about our, our population, we're more accurate. We're more precise with our intervals. So what we're seeing is that as n increases, as these blue numbers get larger and larger, we're decreasing the error and thereby we're also decreasing the size and the width of the interval, right? Because the error, remember, is half the width. And as one gets smaller, the other gets smaller. They're directly relational right up here. We learned that. We learned that the larger your error, the larger your interval, right? Because they go hand in hand. All it is is the interval is twice the error, right? So let me just make a note of that. So just recall that the interval is twice the error, right? And that means they go hand in hand. When one gets bigger, the other gets bigger. We saw that, oops, we saw that a previous page ago. Now, why is this happening? Well, look at the formulas for both of these. And it works for proportions as well. We actually did this one over here for this particular example. We're working on the green one right here. These are confidence intervals for mu. Right? But it would have worked the same for proportions. I just didn't want to make you do it twice. Look where your sample size is. Do you see where the n is in these formulas? It's in the denominator. That's why this is happening. Once it's in the denominator, it makes it inversely relational, um, inversely related. All right, so let me type that up. Okay, so like I just said, because n is in the denominator, denominator for both of these formulas that means that n and the error size width of these intervals are working in opposite directions and that's called inversely related so and I wrote that down here right here right now what does it mean to be inversely related well I kind of drew a little picture for you here they're on a teeter-totter with each other right a seesaw um, kind of thing you play with in um, parks <laughs> and your friend jumps off and you end up hitting your butt on the ground. <laughs> okay, so I put the red arrows together because if error goes down, sample size goes up, right? They're opposites to each other, right? They're going to tilt together. By the same token, in the blue arrows, if error, go, error goes up, sample size goes down and vice versa, right? So they're on a, on a 
seesaw. That's because the error is in the denominator, excuse me, the error is this whole back half of the fraction. All of that's the error. And of course, all of this is the interval itself. And since the n is in the denominator there, it's going to work in an opposite direction from your um, interval. So if n goes up, error goes down. As n goes down, error goes up. And where error goes, the size and the width of the interval go too, because all the error is is twice or half the width of the interval.